This episode of UK Low Carb Podcast is sponsored by Deliciously Guilt Free. Enjoy the show. Hello, welcome back to another episode of UK Low Carb. I really, 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 really hope that you enjoyed the big conversation last week. Uh, we actually launched it as, well, I know you know this already, but um, as one big episode. And then we also split up the show so that you'd have the four individual parts from each speaker as well. Well, just to let you know, if you go to UK Low Carb, uh, put that into YouTube. Uh, we've got about 410 subscribers, so I really want to get that count up if possible. And the videos for each individual speaker will be then in there as well. So if you look in there, uh, then you can you can actually see the diagrams in particular. I know a lot of you are asking about. Uh, that Richard Morris was talking about. Okay, so let's get into today's show then. Hello and welcome to UK Low Carb, the podcast where we share individual stories to help build the low-carb and keto community, not just here in the UK, but also around the world. I'm your host, Dan Grief, and I believe that change comes from grassroots movements for change and that we can actually become the change we want to see in the world. Um, and today's show is very much focused on uh, a story, a very, a very kind of poignant story, but also very relatable and then it shows you, I think, how someone can take their own health journey and transform that for so much good for so many other people. So before I get into that too much, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Just before I do, I have a lovely review here. I appreciate that I might have a few US, US listeners today because Pam Devine is my host, but um, this review is a UK-focused one. Don't tell this person any Americans out there. It says, yes, exclamation mark, finally in the UK. I've been listening to low-carb podcasts for probably over 10 years They've been my encouragement and lifeline to keep me eating this way. They've all been great, but they've all been from the, over the pond in the USA. So finally, to have a real fab low-carb podcast in the UK is such an encouragement, as I now feel more normal and not an oddball for eating differently. I'm really enjoying the great guest speakers. And Dan, I really appreciate the effort you put into this. It's such a blessing. Delicious cakes, too, from Sal Mary. Well, thank you so much for that, Sal or Sal Mary. I don't know which one's your name. Um, or oh, maybe it's all your name. Uh, that really is special. And just to let you know, if you didn't know and you're listening in the UK, any UK listeners now, um, I do actually run a keto bakery called UK, no, called Deliciously Guilt Free. So used to saying, UK low carb. In fact, um, you might see it on the screen behind me if you see the YouTube, my logo come up. And if you use the code FAT Combo, F A T C O N V O, there's a discount on my website, deliciouslyguiltfree.com. So that's for you, Sal Mary, and anyone else out there who's interested in buying some keto cake. So it's now time that we go into today's uh, story of today's guest. And today, of course, I'm talking to Pam Devine. Um, I actually have met Pam, although uh, very, very briefly, it's kind of more like a passing hello, how are you? As I kind of scuttled on by at her conference in 2017, uh, when I went to San Diego to the UK, uh, so to Low Carb USA. I'm putting UK Low Carb beginning of everything here. It's shameless branding, isn't it? Uh, anyway, back to uh, Pam and her story, not mine. So um, first, I just want to say a happy birthday because it is her birthday earlier in the week. Actually, when I'm recording this, it's actually her birthday today. So she's not actually awake yet because uh, the time difference, but um, I've sent her a little birthday message. Um, and just uh, want to say that she is an inspirational person. Person. She's the co-founder with Doug Reynolds of Low Carb USA, and the conferences are incredible. So you may have uh, attended, actually. If you're a UK listener, you might have been in person, but more likely you've probably done the online offering that they do when they had the conference this summer. And it's an incredible experience. So let, let's just sort of break down what these two do. So you, you go to a conference like this, and of course, you turn up for education, probably, most likely, because you want to hear the low-carb keto experts. And of course, Low Carb USA has many of those. But what you find when you're there is the community. And the community is a thing that, for me, was the most poignant part. So I did meet Gary Torbs, and you know I did actually meet Sarah um, Hallberg as well, actually, when I was there briefly. Um, and all these amazing, amazing speakers. But actually, it's the evening meal when you're sat with other low-carb people, and you're able to just to talk about how do you manage in this situation? Do you have any good recipes that are equivalent to X, Y, Z that I'd love? You know, that sort of thing. That I found really powerful. And I made some really good friendships, uh, which I still have ever since. Um, there's actually a little clip from 2017 I, I then found later where um, I'm actually on video at the conference asking questions, um, which I will, I, I won't tell you what I was, who I was asking and why, but I will, I'm sure I'll show you those clips uh, in the future. Um, but while I was there, I did meet Pam briefly and said hello. And I was at the very beginning of my health journey then. 
Uh, so low carb keto was something I knew a bit about, but not much. And I remember people talking about fasting and me thinking, you don't, you go without food. Skipping a meal seemed ridiculously hard to me. And they were saying, yeah, just intermittent fast, skip a meal and don't eat until you're hungry. And it's like, eat when you're hungry. You know, all these things that I was kind of programmed by the Western world, I was suddenly challenged so much at a conference. So it's incredible. And the thing I want to say is these guys do all this because they love helping the community. They don't make any money at these conferences. The money they make goes into the next one. Um, so, And they have another one coming up, by the way, in the winter. And if you'd like to go, there is actually a discount code we have, which is UK Low Carb. So if you put that in, that's actually your discount code to use for future conferences. Uh, so if you're listening to this show, I can't remember what the discount actually is. But to be honest, I'm very happy to pay full price because uh, it pays for this to happen. And I think it's important to support this. And, the, and I think before COVID... The idea of going to a conference like this is probably out of the reach of most people. I mean, I had to save up everything I had to go to it, and but it was worth it for sure. But nowadays, post-COVID, we're now much more used to the idea of going on Zoom, of of you know checking this out in in a digital format, and I really highly recommend that because I I looked at the talks uh, in the summer and they're fantastic, and you can actually ask questions directly, which then Pam uh, will actually ask of the speaker. So you're actually engaging in a conference; you're not just passively watching it; you're actually part of it. Anyway, so go check that out if you want to see uh, any of the conference stuff or anything just to do really with Pam and Doug and the work they do. Just go to lowcarbusa.com. And that's their website. We can sign up um, to their newsletter, listen to their podcast, um, and engage with them in their wonderful, wonderful content. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this show. If you have and you'd like to leave a review, that would be much appreciated. It does make a huge difference to the algorithm. Um, we're always, by the way, in the UK around the kind of 15 in the charts, and that kind of varies between 25 and 15. It doesn't go up beyond there because we don't get many new listeners coming through at a time. So if you can share these episodes or episodes with new people, that just gets the message out there, and reviews obviously help that too. Anyway, have a great week, everyone. Take care. Keep it keto. And I'll now hand over to Pam Devine. So I'm really pleased now to be joined by Pam Devine, who I met briefly in person in 2017. And uh, ever since then, it's been my desire to meet her and Doug again at one of their amazing events. Welcome to the show, Pam, to UK Low Carb. Thank you so much. And we look forward to the next time that you can come and see us in person for sure. It will be so be fun. Amazing. <laughs> I absolutely love that. So, OK, first questions first. Um, I'm going to ask you this one. And that is, how did you meet Doug? What's the story behind that? Oh, gosh, how funny. Um, well, um, we actually met in the airport. <laughs> okay, here we go. Get funny the juicy story. gossip here first, guys. What's that? You get the juicy gossip here first. Oh, dear. Um, yeah, why anybody wants to know is so silly. But um, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of funny. Oh, we, I had missed a flight to come down. I was not living in San Diego. <clears throat> I actually left San Diego in my 20s, lived on the northeast on the east coast where my mom was from, where I was actually born. But I had grown up in San Diego where my dad had lived. And I left, I went back there, and then I was in the Bay Area for my uh -huh. 30s. So, um, and I was coming home to my grandmother's 99th birthday, I think it was. And I missed my flight. No, I checked in. I went to check in and um, I got bumped. That terrible thing where you get to the airport, oh, it's chaos. So you can't go on the plane, right? And they won't let you good. on because they've booked too many people, which is oh. just beyond my, you know, like anybody who's ever gotten bumped, it's like beyond your belief that they could actually overbook a plane. And they say, sorry, we don't have space for you, even though you've paid for your ticket and you've gone through all the trouble of getting there and getting through security and getting to the gate. It was chaos. It was like a Friday night in um, San Jose during Silicon Valley kind of boom days. And it was like all these people. And they're like, sorry, we don't have space on the plane. I'm like, are you serious? So they they said, but we're going to give you a, you know, a voucher so you can take another flight some other time. And we'll rebook well, that's you good for them, isn't it. <laughs> then we'll rebook you for tomorrow. I'm like, so I have to go all the way home and come back tomorrow. <laughs> Great. Let me call the, you know, Uber. It wasn't even Uber. I don't even think there was Uber then. I think it was, <laughs> let me call the taxi or the ride share thing to take me home again. Because how am I going to get home, pay for that again, and then come back? So it was about two weeks before Thanksgiving. And they, um, what, once they did it, I thought, well, 
maybe I can actually afford to come back in two weeks for Thanksgiving, which I wouldn't have been able to do. So all my friends were saying the day before Thanksgiving when I was going, you have to arrive like three hours early so you don't get bumped again. And I was like, geez, I have to work today. It's crazy. And all this stuff had gone wrong with my car. And I got to the airport three hours early, got to security. Not one single person was in line. And I was like, are you kidding me? What am I going to do for three hours? So I went wandering into um, the pub at the airport. So we actually met in the pub at the airport, not just at the airport. <laughs> Love it. What was he doing felt, there? Was he on another bumped flight or something? He, yeah, he had done something funny with his booking, and he would booked the wrong time. I can't remember if he'd missed it or he arrived too early. He always tells it one way, and I always remember it a different way. So, and um, so he ended up being he was sitting at a table. I'd gone, gotten my beer. And looked around and thought, great, there's no place to sit. So what am I going to do for three hours? And the one table seat that was open was next to Doug. And he said, you can sit here if you want. And I was like, are you serious? Are you sure? And he's like, sure, just sit here. So um, he kept having to leave to go and check to see if his flight was, um, if he could get on the next flight. So one time he came back, I called my girlfriend to tell her about the stuff that had happened with my car and stuff that had happened with getting to the airport and he (laughs) always tells everybody I was on the phone the entire time and I never talked to him and it was really rude and I was like that's not how it happened I was talking on the phone when you left and he came back and he literally said do you want another beer and I was like really (laughs) like okay sure and he came back with a beer and I wasn't finished with my call but I said I should probably go because this nice person in front of me just actually bought me a beer and so my friend said you better go and we started talking. Aww. We never stopped talking, though. We, like, found all this stuff that we had in common right away. And it, yeah. it was the weirdest thing because he even said, but one time, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to go check again and see if I can get on this flight. And I was like, okay. And he actually came back again. And then we almost missed the flight that was the last flight that I was on and the last flight that he was going to have to try to get on. We were the very last people getting on the plane. And we actually got the last two like seats film. in the it's back so of the plane to sit to, to together. So, um, and we were on the flight for like an hour and 10 minutes or whatever, whatever it is, down to San Diego again. It was so interesting. I don't know. It was interesting. It was like when you meet somebody and you've known them for a long time where you find that you have all the stuff in common with them and we were then we were you know walking out and it was almost like we almost went our separate ways without either one of us saying so how do we should we keep in touch <laughs> like yeah, at the very yeah. last minute we were like we should probably keep in touch <laughs> so do you mind me asking how old were you when you met um don't remember i must have been we were, well, we met late so when we were both married before i was probably 30 i don't know we moved in together just before i turned 40 um, when we finally decided to get serious because he was traveling a lot and I was in the middle of trying to figure out work and we lived in different places. So we like did really long, like we were friends first. We just kept in touch and you know, sent jokes and sent things. And then we got to a point where we actually really looked forward to talking to each other. And there was a point where he was in India and we literally would turn on the, a movie online or on TV on demand at the same time. And watch a movie watch together. together. <laughs> Online. That's so sweet. So the reason I asked that is because I met my wife when I was in my, how old was I? Early 30s, like 33, 34, something like that. Yeah, it was probably 35, 36, something. And I think that helps. I think it does change things. I think when you're that age, you suddenly, like when I met her, we we, we met and then um, six months later I proposed to her. And then under a year from meeting her, we were married. Aww. So it's very quick. But I think it's we didn't just, go as I quick. Just, yeah, well, but you were, I suppose, in a sort of relationship quite quick. It's like when you just know, when you know yourself and they know themselves, that really helps, doesn't it? Because, like, you know, your values are pretty well established. You know the things that you're interested in. You know, you can smell BS. You can, you know, detect genuine feelings. And I think that helps, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. I think I had so much BS before that. It was like, is this person real? <laughs> Yeah, he seems like a yeah. nice person you know the nice when you finally meet somebody who does it has that you can kind of detect that integrity and that um i don't know that they loyalty and those kind of 
things that you really admire in a person. And like, you know, there was a point where it was like, oh, see you when you see, when we see you. It wasn't like immediate of we're going to, you know, like this is really something and we're going to go after it. It was not that it was, yeah. I'll talk to you later. I'll see you when I see you or, you know, write to me whenever call, when, you know, it wasn't right away. And then it got to the point where we were like, mm, we don't really like going a day without talking to each other. And that was more towards the, maybe the last year when we, um, the year when we decided things really turned more and more ro- rom- romantic and let's, um, Move, you know, yeah, let's move in together. And this is really something that we want to savor for a long time. Um, I when, love that. So you know, <laughs> in that case, in terms of your journey, then was he doing low carb at the time or not? Or did you come across this together? Because I know he came onto my show and he's talking about, um, you know, the, the marathons that he was running, being a long distance runner, but he's starting to put the weight on. And then, you know, he, talk, he talked about that before. So I want to know which point did you start doing low carb? Was it this time when you met him? Was he doing it already or did you discover it together? No, we discovered it together. We actually, um, I, I remember um, one of the times where we were able to actually spend some time together. Um, he had come into town to, some, to do some work in San Francisco and I traveled to San Francisco and he was um, training for a run. And what he used to, he might've told a story if maybe, I don't know, in India, um, when he was working in India, he actually had to have a driver drive him somewhere to go and train, like because he really liked the race in South Africa that he most um, often did that he was training for had a lot of hills, and to get out of the city because running in the city was um, had a lot of landmines and things that were um, not pleasant to run in the city in India. Um, it was you know dirty kind of running into things that you didn't want to see on the street. That weren't from animals, dogs, or cows. But anyway, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So he was training for a race, and I remember I used to follow him around, literally with um, bottles of Coca Cola. Um, that was oh, his really? carb wow. loading fuel, like, you know, running off, oh, running and burning sugar. He was a sugar burner for sure. Yeah. Um, and he actually ran a race. Um, yeah, he ran a race that year before we moved in together, and then the. He was tra- he would train early in the morning. The next year after we moved in, um, with a local friend of his, It'd run really early in the morning and tr- run the hills. And I was able to go to South Africa with him and see the country and meet his family and see the race itself. It's a comrades marathon, and I would in that time where I was in San Diego with him, I literally drove around the city for miles and miles and hours, Dan, with Coca Cola in the back of the um, car and he would, there was a place where he had to stop. He had a, he would put a couple of dollars in a plastic bag in his shorts to buy one. He didn't eat a lot. And I don't remember him eating very many of those carb loading, funky running gels, but um, it was usually the drink and some electrolytes, but not as much as he would do now. Now. So fast forward a few years, we worked a couple of different jobs together. Um, We were working, I worked at that time he was working in an engineering firm and they needed some quality assurance people. And I started working there. We ended up doing it from home. This next job that we had together after um, that stuff changed, we both got laid off. It was very sad within a Mm. six month period. And then we had to really figure out what we were going to do with the next chapter of our lives. And we ended up working for a startup. It was a financial uh, technical uh, a technically pl- uh, uh, a financial uh, institution that was on a, um, online and right. Doug uses commu- computer engineering to do that. And I use my kind of customer service and, um, and learned marketing. And that's where we learned how to do seminars. But at that time we were commuting a long distance. Um, we were still trying to be really active. We were both training at martial. It was a functional martial arts class. Mm -hmm. Um, that we were taking for self-defense and it was somebody that we had met as as we were making that transition even probably before we left that first job we were working at um, we got into um, sports nutrition company and we were actually volunteering for our running club we were bringing carb loaded based drinks we done a big expo for our there's rock and roll marathons locally here I think they're probably doing them in the UK now right 
Um, and they were mostly carb based drinks. And we probably did that for four years until we got introduced to low carb. So we were at this um, executive, we were on the executive staff, we were in a corporate setting, we were commuting, we were still trying to do our martial arts and do our ex- other expos for community um, health and doing the running club promotion, but we were both putting on weight still. Yeah. And we were very Which confused. Which is weird you hear people say, I've got to lose this weight, I've got to go to the gym. And if, and I've thought this before about, the, about Doug's story and obviously your story too. If you're that active and you're still putting on weight, there's something not right, right? It makes no sense. I was like, I knew that within the running club, there were more active runners than me. Um, I started as a very beginner runner. I um, I had never run before until we started attending these um, running meetups. And they were literally training for marathons. And I was starting from scratch. So I, I knew I wasn't running as much as they were. But Doug was still running some distance. He wasn't training for marathon yeah. anymore. Sadly, he had sprained his ankle about six times over a less than six year period, poor thing, and um, wow. really kind of sidelined his training. And, but we were still doing two or three nights a week at martial arts, two, one to two nights per week tr- running, and one on, on a whole Saturday morning running. And I was still putting on weight, and I'm thinking, of all the people in my office, we're more active than they are. We're not maybe as active as a lot of our running friends, but it was mind boggling to me that we would continue to put on weight. It's like, okay, yeah. what else can we do? I would walk at lunch. I was getting really confused about what to eat. I was trying to go more fruit, more whole grains, less white, you know, yeah. cut out the white things. You know, you hear that, um, don't eat um, white bread white potatoes, white rice. So I was going whole grain rice, <laughs> um, potatoes yeah. with the skin on, if at all. Um, there was a time where um, Doug had learned to do some cooking when we were first getting together and he got some recipes from his mom and it was like spaghetti, uh, macaroni and cheese and some other things that were, you know, those home cooked things that his yeah. mom would make. And he used really to always want to food by the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah. And he would make a big pot of spaghetti bolognese but then it was pasta with it. So I was always like, don't give me all the pasta. I'm going to put vegetables and some cottage cheese and a little bit. Of, like he would say, how much pasta do you want? I'm like, this much. <laughs> like I wanted, <laughs> I wanted no pasta. So I was really trying to change the way I was eating, but I was still putting on weight. I had, so I was 45 at this time, 46. Um, don't want to share too much, but I was going into menopause at early. So at 46, I was like, okay, maybe it's that. My hormones are changing. I'm sitting in a chair during the day. A lot of the days out of jail. Mind you, you're seeing Doug putting on weight too. So but that's then Doug's putting on weight. Yeah. I, I knew he was kind of sloppy about his diet because he would say, what do you, what are we going to have for lunch? Or I would say, what do you want? He said, oh, just give me the burger and, the, and chips and a Coke. And I was like, again? I'm like, that is so bad. Or pizza. We'll just get pizza. So he was, you know, not really trying, but I was trying to do it for us. So I was making kale and he was like, do I have to have kale? (laughs) And (laughs) um, quinoa. He's like, this quinoa is really bitter. I don't really like it. I'm like, but it's good for you. (laughs) That's that's the thing I haven't eaten for years. Thank God. And I I I do not miss it at all. (laughs) Terrible, right? So then yeah. I was trying to make mashed, they had this mashed quinoa. I used to like the mashed potatoes in a box. So they had them like flakes, quinoa flakes. And I would try to make it like a mashed potato. And he's like, this tastes funny. So <laughs> long story long, you know, we got, um, we had gotten to know some people through um, nutrition um, organizations and somebody had moved on to a new company and, and they sent an email to Doug and said, we were like, oh, what's he doing now? And it was actually, um exogenous ketones and he was the the email said um ketones an alternate source of fuel than glucose and it was kind of lean it doug thought of it as for performance and for running but it was also lifestyle and he's like wait a minute what is this what and he never heard of it before started looking and until he told a story about going down a rabbit hole and saying what is this? Found Jeff Bullock and Steve Finney's um, book on um, low carbohydrate living and low carbohydrate for performance and realizing that there was a lot of science behind um, 
how your body can use a different fuel source and started reading more. It was about two weeks. I kept saying, are you still reading about what I said? Are you still reading the stuff about keto, the ketogenic diet? And he's like, yeah, it's fascinating. And then I said, okay, tell me more. Tell me what you're reading now. Um, you know, you found a couple other um, people and a couple other books and he says, okay, we're going to do this. So he actually made a list. And said, okay, I made a list and we're going to the grocery store. And Dan, I had to say, wait a second. You made a list and you wanted to go to the grocery store with me? <laughs> <laughs> this is Mr. Just Chuck Out a Burger or a Pizza. What's going on? Yeah, and I'd have to beg him, go to the grocery store with me. And it was basically, you know, help me, you know, get the groceries into the car and into the house because we were living in a condo at that time. And he was like, do I have to? And a lot of times it was just call me when you're getting back and I'll help you carry the groceries in. <laughs> um so I was like really so okay and then he's like do you want to know what's on my list and I was like I'm afraid to ask you know it was like be meat and vegetables but there was a lot of butter and full fat cream and full fat yogurt which was impossible to find I don't know if anybody who is really? familiar with when they started low carb diet and were looking for a higher fat alternatives it's yeah. really it was really hard to find the Greek yogurt that was full fat. It was down at the very bottom of the wall of low fat flavored yogurts. You know what's interesting? Because actually there's a there's a well, the highest fat yogurt I know is like five percent fat mm -hmm. or something. So it's still quite low, really. Yes. Um, but it's really creamy, this one here. And then I realized about two years ago I was eating it with some berries, and then I thought, hang on a minute, why don't you just put on some double cream, which is Heavy, heavy cream, I think you call it in the States. Or yes. is it heavy whipping cream? I don't know. Yes. Um, and I was like, just have some double cream and berries. It's just nicer, tastier. And of course, it's just the fat for the milk. So why not? And it's so much more pleasant than yogurt anyway. So I just drop yogurt completely now and go for that. Well, that's good. And everybody kind of does, you know, as we do go along with this, we all go with our the, what we like taste wise right and um, yeah 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 and texture i remember and, eating greek you know. yogurt a few years before that and when it first started coming out and then all of a sudden someone said something to me or or there was a commercial for a lower fat alternative of greek yogurt and i was like wait a minute and i didn't actually ever really notice how much fat was in the greek yogurt and i was like whoa that was when I, in my low fat days i was like oh i can't eat this there's too much fat in it so yeah, i started yeah. going I either went back to the low fat. I know they were, had been coming out with the low fat sugar free or no sugar added um, yogurt. So I was always trying to well, go. This to annoys no me a little bit because you know what, you take the fat out and I know people say about putting sugar into stuff to make it taste better, which is true. But even if you just have yogurt and you take the fat out of it, it's naturally going to have more lactose by, by portion because you, you, you're taking the quantity of fat out and it's got then more of the quantity of the lactose in it. So you know, it kind of annoys when they say no added sugar because actually the whole thing is just higher in sugar. Yeah. Like there's um, recently um, there was like this coconut, desiccated coconut, and I looked at it, it was really dry and looked awful. And I was like, this has been defattened. You can tell they've like squeezed it for the milk or whatever. And this is like the fibrous like rubbish that's left. But it was like <laughs> about three times higher in sugar because, of course, there's more of it in the packet because they've taken the fat out of the actual desiccated coconut, meaning that you're eating more sugar per serving. It's just, mm. you know, it's just what happens. You take one thing out, then it changes the proportion. So you've got higher amount of sugar in it. And people are then eating way more sugar than they would normally. Plus the food industry then add sugar to make the flavor better. And suddenly you've got a dessert, which used to be like a breakfast is now like a dessert for breakfast, which is crazy. It has gone crazy. Um, I remember that's funny that you point that out. Um, I had a patient back. Um, oh, one thing I didn't go into my most of my career in my 20s and 30s was all in, in the medical field as a um, x-ray tech a radiographer. Oh. And I had migrated from hospital setting to a doctor's office setting because a lot of the um, moving around, I'd hurt my back in the hospital, moving a patient. And um, I know what it's like to not quite get proper treatment that people get with chronic disease, with chronic pain. I had to go through yeah. that. And it was, it should have been something that would have been much easier had it been addressed correctly early on. Um, and I've only come to, it took me 10, 20 years to figure that out, sadly. But oh, wow. I had moved into um, a doctor's office setting and I had a patient who was from, I think she was from Russia or Eastern Bloc area somewhere. And I remember her saying to me that she was really frustrated because she loves milk and she'd been drinking milk in the U.S. And she was putting on weight that she hadn't 
she was drinking the same amount, but our, our milk had so much more sugar in it. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, how is that possible? Are they adding sugar or was it the, it could have been the low fat skim milk that is so much more sugar versus fat. I didn't, it wasn't positive, but she says, take a look at the package and look how many, how much sugar is in it or how many, how many carbs. And I was like, that's a really interesting point. Like I never thought, is it different somewhere else in the world? And she, she was frustrated because she was putting on weight from it. Well, well, I mean, basically, if you think about like, um, if you just take a bottle of milk, uh, a pint of milk, for instance, and say, for instance, one fifth of the bottle is, is cream uh, and you take that out and then you would put in the same quantity of milk again, you just have a much more sugary drink because it's more concentrated in sugar and less concentrated in fat that's and that's before they even add anything it's just it's just a higher percentage a bit i mean that's what i realized with this stuff like per 100 grams you're going to have or per ounce or whatever there's going to be more sugar for the ingredient because there's less of the other and i think that's the thing like taking fat out before the big food even touches it naturally pushes the sugar up that's the problem mm-hmm. and then you've got people who now are so adapted to thinking that's normal so, you know, people, I, I don't know anybody actually who likes skim milk. I just know people who feel that they've got to have it. But I, when I taste it now, I think it's really sweet. It's quite shocking how sweet it is. Plus, of course, when you don't have the fat in the thing, the fat actually stops you ingesting the sugar so much. Whereas when you don't have it, there's nothing to stop it. And of course, the fat soluble vitamins don't go into your body when you have the fat taken out. So it's actually stripping you of minerals and nutrients and it's putting sugar into your body faster. And that's a health food. <laughs> Incredible. I think that's a really interesting point. Um, and I never, it was one of the a real aha moment when I, as we've gotten into through our conferences and through educational processes and listening to lectures and um, reading articles from people um, who are, you know, educating us on what the history of um, food products are and where they are now and how our bodies work. and when we think about how our bodies are always looking for what we need. And then yeah. like you were saying, like, one of the other reasons why you might continue to drink more milk than you need because the fat's removed and you're getting more sugar is looking for protein. Your body wants yeah. to fulfill yeah. its, pro- pro- its protein need first before anything else. And carbohydrates have been told, we've been told that carbohydrates are essential for, for our fuel source, for our bodies to have energy but it's really not. And it really needs protein. It wants to build our muscles. It wants to use the amino acids. It wants to use the fat to make our hormones and support our immune system and all the things that we kind of scratch our head now and go, Oh, how come we didn't know that before? Like we were always yeah. told we needed carbs for energy, but what about all the other, and we needed protein for muscles, but protein and amino acids do a whole lot more. Um, other yeah. things that they help our brain function. Um, they, they coat our brain and our, our um, um, nervous cells, our um, uh, spinal cord and all the nerves in our body. And it's fascinating when you really start to look at, okay, we started, like Doug first started looking at this, okay, maybe as a performance thing for running, but also to lose weight because kind of why are we putting on weight and learning what is insulin resistance and did we have it? We never, we hadn't had blood tests to tell us that we did have it but it was apparent okay right you know yeah it was like, obvious. Like me and like many people you can see the signs of it i suppose in yourself and you don't need a test to, to tell you got high insulin you just know that you know the insulin's doing its job and that's why you can see it happening that's the weight gain isn't it yeah and it, it really um confirms it without having to test for it but you know when we really looked at what um fuels our body and what when we're looking for well you'll hear the term people will talk about nutrient dense food and eating to fuel your body and you know I, I may have had a feeling but I really didn't understand that up to the down sugar roller coaster is not normal and yeah, yeah. one of the biggest freedoms it's, it's for the me, norm for a lot of people which is obviously it's abnormal but it's also common right so it's so common now and there's so much sugar in our in our food system and so much sugar going into our system that people think it's normal and yeah. that's why they adding more and more sugar because people's taste buds are so used to the sugar so they think like you said like you know certain kind of milk that doesn't have sugar it doesn't taste good to people they think oh this doesn't, you know maybe it tastes sweet to us now like i even had people say 
um, on stage during a lecture that they think water tastes sweet now. You know, it's just really? taste buds have changed wow. a little bit. It, I think it was, um, I think it was Ann Childers. She was a psychiatrist in Portland, Oregon, here in the States in the Northwest. And I remember drinking water and thinking after she said that, does this now taste sweet to me? Like, is there a sweet component? It could be the way it was filtered. It could have been that they took the minerals out as they filtered it. So now it doesn't taste, you know, now it tastes sweeter. That's um, great. Wow. I got him at blooming out. I hope it's not got sugar in it. I'll be dead. <laughs> There's no sugar problem, in it. It just it? tastes sweet. Because yeah, I think thank goodness her, for that. <laughs> her water probably had been filtered the minerals out now that I think about it so now it's probably tasting even a little bit different so you know it's interesting um the things we've learned over so we started in 2015 so we're in 2021 now and um we saw changes for ourselves women you know the women who are listening to this and any of the male who are listening to this who have had spouses or girlfriends or females in their life do this at the same time we don't always lose weight as fast as men do. And it's mm -hmm. frustrating for us, but um, you know, it took me a little bit longer than did Doug. Um, he, his weight fell off of him and he lost 35 pounds in just a few months. And everybody in our office was like, you know, wow, what are you doing? And we would run into people we hadn't seen in a while. And they were like, what's, what's going on with you guys? Um, especially him. Cause he lost it really quickly. Um, one of our friends had actually thought he was sick. <laughs> and oh, he's really? like, no, oh, I'm no. healthier than I've ever been. And I feel better. Great. I have all kinds of energy and no, I don't have cancer. So you see people would see someone who loses weight quickly and yeah, think yeah, they're yeah. sick. They assume they, don't they the worst. Yeah. Instead of, and, you know, it's kind of, and it's become normal, you know, especially now, like, what is it? The COVID, it was the COVID five. And now it's the COVID 29 or something like right. the average amount of weight that someone's put on over the last 18 months or oh, whatever. Yeah, it has, yeah, 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 it's like yeah. 29 pounds now. So, and that's becoming more and more normal. Um, yeah. Because we're not in healthy lifestyle situations, stress is adding to things, but, and it's not, move more, eat less. It can be move more and eat properly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you know, moving more is obviously going to be good for all of us. Um, what movement is good. Um, we don't ever want to get stagnant and stiff and but we want to always keep our well, on that, actually, I was going to ask you about that because I've been looking at some of the videos and in fact, you're in one of them with Dr. Ben doing resistance training. Um, so before I get onto that, cause I don't want to, I don't want to miss on another opportunity I've just had there. Um, when I spoke to Doug before, he said, and and I, I he's a very different personality type to me. He said that he is quite um, straightforward. So I think that's a good way of describing it. So if he makes a plan to change his diet, then overnight he changes his diet and that's it, he sticks to it. Whereas I tend to be a bit more, well, not massively an emotional eater, but I can be tempted by food. Cravings for me are a real thing. I believe actually to some extent I have an addiction as well to to wheat. Because if I have, you know, I know, and I've said this on a few podcasts now, I know that if I if I have wheat on one day, then it's very likely I'm going to have it the next day or the next day, and it's going to be a cycle. And mm -hmm. I find that really hard to break. Whereas Doug said, he just makes a decision, he changes, that's it. Where were you in terms of the change? How did you find the change in your nutrition? Was it easy? Or were you like Doug, or did you find it a bit more challenging? I was definitely not 100% like Doug was. And yeah. Like I was I saying, I, I had around. like, I had a routine in the morning where I was trying to eat healthy. I was doing, okay, so my typical breakfast was oatmeal or and or a granola bar, like a granola nut bar. Um, Let me guess, and, did you have a snack then mid morning? You oh, yeah. Well, like I haven't. And I was eating a banana and that low fat yogurt with no sugar added. So I was Ouch. going pretty low. I was still sort of low sugar, but and low fat. But I was starving ten, ten, two hours yep. later, starving. Yep. Like, don't talk to me starving. Like, I yeah. have to go Proper to, hangry. oh, hangry is not, I, yeah, it's, it was terrible. And people, hangry is not normal. Like, I was just talking about the roller sugar roller coaster. The biggest thing for me going low carb was food freedom. I use the yeah. word food yeah. freedom. I do not get hangry. And I nobody misses being hangry because you just want to kill the people in your office. And <laughs> um, I was like, I wasn't shaking, but I was sh sort of, you know, and I was getting a headache and I was panicky. Like, well, uh, I need to go. And I'd be like, Doug, 
I have to run over to the deli and all I could think of was hard boiled eggs. So I needed protein and I needed fat. I wanted hard boiled eggs. I wanted deli meat. I wanted something with that didn't have carbs and sugar in it. I was like starving by 10 o'clock in the morning or whatever. But 930. I was like, it's only 930 and I want to eat again. (laughs) Yeah. And your body's looking for protein again, wasn't it? Like you said. It was trying to find protein and fats. Yeah, I didn't have enough. I was okay. Oatmeal has a little bit of protein, but it's not very much. So, and I wasn't putting enough. I was started putting a little bit of nuts and chia, or I was eating the bar, but there was still sh- enough sugar in it. There wasn't and carbs yeah. in it. There, there really wasn't enough protein. Um, the low fat yogurt, skim milk yogurt, whatever it was, didn't have enough protein. I yeah. thought peanut butter had protein in it, but not you know not as much as eating meat or you know ham or eggs. Or yeah, whatever. Yeah. So my body was still looking for protein and fats and then I'd be okay. And then someone at lunchtime would say, let's get a pizza for our meeting. I'm like, no, let's not get oh. pizza for our meeting. So I was always like, can we get a salad with some chicken on or whatever? There were a couple of places around us that I was going for the healthy meal and it was salad with protein or, you know, there was one that did a really nice freshly made salmon with homemade soups and, So, and I was trying to do the whole grain rice, but anyway, as we were changing, I still had a hard time cutting out bananas and granola for, you know, so whatever I had in the cupboard, I finished because I don't like to waste food. And I also had to change my mindset. So I did, I finished some of the stuff we had. um, And I, as I changed, I know, I remember like the, that was like breakfast. I know at lunchtime we were often bringing our own food or learning what we order out. Um, I remember doing like a ranch dip probably made ourselves because as we learned that what they call seed oils in this community was not a term that I'd ever used heard before. So vegetable oils, (laughs) well, they say it's it's made from vegetables, but it's really not. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. And also, just the other day, because this is one thing I think, Pam, that, you know, you, uh, you're you in the same world as me. So we talk about seed oils and just how bad they are. And so you just Keep kind of assume that everyone thinks that. And then the other day I was talking to somebody in my family who said right. the opposite. They said, no, no, you should eat seed oils. They're the healthiest. And I was like, hang on a minute. Most people believe what you believe. I, I kind of forget that fact. And it's it's quite worrying, isn't it? It really is. We've been told for decades. Thing. And, you know, my, my parents have and my sister hasn't been able to um, – migrate over to this they just still don't understand why anybody would have recommended something that wasn't good for them so they're still eating margarine we went to thanksgiving our thanksgiving here in the states one year and i brought a stick of butter and my sister said you brought your own butter and i said yes she says we have butter here i said you have margarine and she had to think about it she's like oh don't we have real butter and she's like no we probably don't isn't that the same Uh, people don't know do they they don't know no they don't and and they still, you know, until you can get someone to really read some stuff, which not everybody will, they just use people still don't understand it. And so yeah. seed oils, what is that? What do you think of chia seed oil, <laughs> sunflower seed oil, sunflower seed oil? So, so sunflower, canola, I guess canola is a seed. What is canola made from? <laughs> I, oh, I know the answer to this. So um, do you know what it, do you know where canola comes from as a name? Tell it me. It's Canada, low acid. So Ooh. it was a engine fuel they built uh, made in Canada <laughs> for engines. And the low acid was good because, of course, it wouldn't corrode the engine. So canola means, yeah, like can- Canadian low acid. And um, I think, I believe it's like rapeseed, which is what we have in this country. Um, but anyone listening can can follow up on that. But yeah, Does it's anybody want to eat engine oil? Yeah. I don't. An engine oil that didn't have much taste, so they thought... We can sell this to, to people and they'll buy it it's because it comes from a plant. It must be fine. So it's from a plant and, and it doesn't have any taste and it's that color because they've bleached it yeah. and they've heated right. it. And Yeah. So it's had lots of chemical processes. And also when you squeeze a seed, how much oil do you get out? You know, you have to squeeze it to get the tiny bit out. And then, of course, you have to do it in a solvent bath and then pull the sol- The solvent will actually, the chemical bath will pull out chemically all the rest of the oil. I mean, you know, if that, if you want to eat that, then, then be my guest. But I, I wouldn't recommend it compared to an animal fat, which is, you know, made by the animal. You eat it. We've been eating it for millennia. It's the one of the most sort of natural things that humans have eaten. So I'll stick to that personally. 
Yeah. And you know what? The average person who ever is maybe coming across this podcast and listening to us talk and wondering what the heck are you talking about? Everybody has heard for our lifetime, don't have meat, saturated fat. Don't have yeah, yeah. Um, the natural fats. But why would we not want to eat the natural fats? Why, when when we all started eating a little bit more coconut oil, were all these warnings coming out about the saturated fat content of coconut oil? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, is that something that we need to really be leaving out of our diet and that we like you said have lived on for millennials since you know evolution <laughs> or since yeah. we were put on this earth or however where we came across it you know yeah i mean it's weird i think you're totally right the ancient foods which have not changed really i mean yeah okay plants have changed massively in their evolution because they've been bred haven't they for hundreds of years to be the biggest yield or a few thousand years to be the biggest yield they can be Animals may have been bred to be bigger, but they're in essence the same as an animal. They're just bigger. And so, okay, unless you unless you genetically modify it through science now, but they've been bred to be bigger. They're not bred to be completely different animals. Whereas I did my degree was on archaeology, and one of our lecturers came in with this really weedy piece of light grass. And he said, This is actually an extinct piece of wheat that was in his house. He had a medieval house. So this house must have been like 800 years old or something. And he said, This was in the roof and the thatch. Oh, and he wow. said, so this would have been put here and this is now gone like as a species. And it looked very similar to the grass you get, you know, when you get like the, the sort of ears of yes. like, it looks like corn on grass, really tiny. And nowadays you walk into a field of wheat and they're massive, like huge, great things. And of course, there's less fiber, there's higher sugar. It's actually chemically a different kind of food because it has been bred to be this massive super crop. Um, so it's not the same sort and fruit like that as well. Fruit is, I was going to say, have you seen, and I'd encourage anybody on here to say, okay, look at a, look up what a banana used to look like and what a banana looks like now. Strawberry. Watermelon is really interesting. Watermelon, they were probably this big and now they're. (laughs) Yeah. It was also like really fibrous inside. Uh, and the, and the pink was a tiny little amount of pink inside, but now it's all pink inside and all sugar based. So, you know, totally different. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, all those things that we see as being natural, and yet the ancient foods like an egg has been attacked many, many times for the cholesterol count or, you know, or steak or whatever it might be has been attacked. And I find that really quite sad because so many people I think nowadays are really depleted in particularly protein. And I think veganism, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges with being vegan, I think, if you are following that way of life, is that when you start having a vegan diet, then you are cutting back on your protein. And that has a huge impact on your health, doesn't it? And I think it's a it's a chronic illness factor in our in our countries right now. It's definitely going to lead to more chronic illness. Um, when you yeah. look at how much our brain needs of those amino acids, and so anybody who's doing a vegan diet is going to really have to supplement, and they should already know this. They're going to need B twelve. They're going to need um, those amino acids. Um, D D E A. I always say this wrong. I should have it like written down somewhere so I can always remember the um, EPA, D, DHA, those fatty acids that our brain needs to function. And when oh, we talk about yeah. when we talk about how much, and this is something um, a big aha moment for me when Georgia Eads spoke at our conferences, um, speaks at them. Um, how much our those, our brain needs those. And how yeah. much children need those for their brain and development? Um, Rob Silas yeah. talks about this a lot. These um, are like optional extras. These are essential to being a healthy human being, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So when we think yeah. about how much mental illness and and um, autism is mental illness, so that's a developmental mental illness. Depression and anxiety is going through the roof. And I saw something recently, or somebody said something recently that anxiety in children is almost like something to be like they they're being treated for anxiety like it's like oh, right a passage terrible. that every child is going through like children don't need to be treated for anxiety and why are they having more anxiety yeah, having too much sugar sad. in their diet they're not having enough healthy fats and protein so their brains aren't functioning correctly on a daily basis they may not be forming correctly you know in early childhood That's really sad isn't it it really yeah. is and then we get into adulthood and you know our emotions are you know we have enough things to deal with without not having to have a steady emotional um 
profile makeup of our brain, right? Um, yeah, completely. So I want to get into the conferences, but before I do, let's just talk about exercise because oh, yes. Dr. Ben was was doing, and I've got the uh, rubber bands actually. I don't know where they are, but I've got them somewhere. They arrived uh, in the post a few weeks ago, and they've been sitting there accumulating dust. So I need to get into it. So Pick maybe I'll contact Dan. Dr. Ben directly <laughs> and say, "Can you help me here?" But it seems like the. I mean, I, I personally believe that resistance training is one of the best things you can do, apart from like intensive, you know, hits training. Yeah. I think that the resistance training is really important. And what he was showing and what he was showing you to do in the video was to use these rubber bands rather than a weight because a free weight has a mechanical element that means it gets easier once you get past the sticking point. And you're also more likely to damage or, you know, injure yourself with the weight because you're, you know, you're flying a weight around the air and, of course, your joints are taking it. Whereas the bands have a certain level of resistance that increases the more you're doing. So actually at the maximum amount of stretch, it's the hardest. And he talks about, and I, and I learned this all from the conference this year because I, I heard his talk. I didn't know who he was before this conference. And um, he was talking about the different muscle layers getting the real deep exercise, which I, and the science is incredible. I was really, really fascinated. So what what sort of exercise do you do now? Do you work with the, the resistance bands? Do you do that sort of workout? Oh, so Dr. Ben changed our lives, our lives. Let me just tell you that. So when we met Dr. Ben, he came, he knows Gary Tabs, and he was at one of our conferences. I think it was in 2017. Hard to believe that it's been that long now. Um, That's my conference. That's the one yeah, I Yeah, he was there, but him. he was there only for a short time. He wanted to see Gary Tabs speak. He came for uh, some other time and he met um, someone else there. I was friends of him. That's also in the space with the, the slow um, training space with him. Um, yeah. So he and he came to talk to us and tell us a little bit. Doug st thought he started to incorporate some of his slow training into his um, program, but he'll tell a story. He never he actually um, didn't realize that he wasn't doing anything close. Um, right. And to go back to the video, okay, that was my very first YouTube video. I can't believe that. I couldn't believe at the time. Okay, my first YouTube video is going to be me working out. Okay, I'm not a workout. <laughs> <laughs> I was working out, but I wasn't a workout person. I definitely wasn't going to be the you know video workout person. So, and I was laughing. I looked at it after. I said, Why am I so serious? Well, Dr. Ben will say this is a very cerebral workout, right? You have to think about yeah. going really slowly, right? Most yeah, of us yeah, are agree, used to yeah. doing, you know, Doug would laugh at me. He's like, I used to see you in the gym or, and compare me to a lot of other people he sees in the gym and you do some weights and it's like, choo, 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 choo. Yeah. you're like, they're really we'll fast. By number <laughs> as well. This is very interesting. So, you know, I'd do a set with a set would be 10 uh, repetitions and, I, and by number like seven, you're like, well, I'm always done now. So whatever. Whereas this oh, no, is going to Dad. failure. This is going to failure, which is completely different because there's no end until your body can't do it anymore, which is a whole different kind of workout, really. It is. And I love the um, what Dr. Ben says. He says, so um, he's been in the exercise space for decades. And, you know, we had one of the first gyms in um, the New York City area on Staten Island. And people said to him, like, people are going to pay you to go and use, like, these workout equipment? Like, that's crazy. Think about yeah. that state. That's so funny. So um, he used to think, well, if we're going to do three sets of 15 and the hardest ones are the last three or four, why don't we just do the last three or four? And it's like, that makes sense. But how does it work? Right. So he'll um, in his presentation, like you said, he explains that the um, fast switch muscles the, and the slow switch muscles and the type B fibers and you know once you get through so your muscle's going to use a certain thing when it's just starting out you know and a lot of the well, things that you would use sprinting or you know doing normal uh, activity movement and then once it starts failing that one then it goes to the next type and then it goes to the next type after that one's getting tired then it gets to that really important type B fiber I believe it is where everything else is tired now it's got to use its last resort and it, yeah. then it also starts releasing fatty acids for fuel. And you've depleted your glycogen you normally by the time you get to that point. And then you use these and it releases fatty acids. So not only are you not just depleting your glycogen and you're just starving after, because like for me, when I ran, starving after. And <laughs> if I did yeah, aerobics yeah. or any of those aerobic activities that uses other type um, muscle fibers that are just depleting your glycogen and using glycogen and glucose for fuel 
Yeah, I was yeah. starving and tired. Um, yes, we do Dr. Ben's slow maximum resistance training. So it's smart. Um, you can access it on lowcarbusa.org. Search for smart training. There's a couple of blogs. And like you said, you can find our videos also on YouTube. Um, if you look for the smart training um and you'll see me working out which is really funny and i'm like glad that some ladies will say i'm so glad to see a normal woman working out like anybody can do this um kids yeah, can that, do it you know what, you're, you're right there and actually i think we should all have more confidence to show our working out as normal people because you know i'm by no means a dub you know Doug, yeah. he, he looked pretty ripped to me when i saw him and i was like whoa okay he's really he really obviously looks like somebody who works out a lot yeah, it's actually more inspiring to see somebody like <laughs> I'm being arrogant here, but like me, who's not a fit looking guy at all, but who's accessing this and being healthy. And, you know, that's that's a, that should be the norm, shouldn't it? The norm yes, should be should. seeing people exercise. I think yeah, really you don't healthy. have to be the 80s, you know, Jane Fonda with the leotard and the leg warmers and all no, you want to do I is do wear all those know. in the gym still that's my look um, right? i'm not going to give up on that okay we should all have leg warmers <laughs> and headbands but you know anybody can do this and dr ben will tell the story he used to work in um a couple of medical facilities that were post-op and one of them was a cardiac post-op surgery and one of them was spinal post-op surgery um it, and we have people in their 70s and 80s that are doing this I spoke to somebody um, before San Diego. I had called him. He'd bought tickets to San Diego 2020 that got canceled. And I wanted to let him know that his ticket was still good to come back 2021. Unfortunately, he had um, gotten sick over COVID with COVID, I think, and it affected his lungs. So he's actually yeah. now has to be on oxygen all the time. But he's still doing smart training. He's doing as what smart training he can. If he has to sit in a chair and do it with his bands, he does that. He can do whatever the other ones. Yeah. That's, that's what Dr. Ben says. will go through. You come at this from wherever you come from. You adjust know, you like, you... it to your level. And yeah. that's what's so great. Doug and I can do it together. And like you look and think that he's a you know weightlifter. Um, and I can do the same. Like we used to go to the gym when the gyms were open together and I would, we would go one weight and he would put his weight level on and do his sets, um, yep. 30 to 90 seconds to failure. So if it's too light, you'll do too many for too long until you're like, or you'll never be like, Oh, I can't do another one. You need to get to that point of, I can't do another one. You yep, can do yep. often in 30 seconds, but then the weight's really heavy. So it has to be light enough that you can move it for at least 30 seconds. Um, yep. So, for example, we're um, doing the motion of the first one we do is leg extension. So for your quadriceps and you um, go as heavy as you can that you can get at least three up slowly, down slowly, up slowly, down slowly. And one thing that Ben taught us, and it's and it's really good to sometimes have someone to spot you if you can do it as a partner, but you don't yeah. need it. You can do it on your own and not do this. But if you can. Have, if you have trouble with that last one, lifting that last one, and you can only get to a certain point, if that partner or person to spot you can actually slowly help you lift that. So you still have a little bit of muscle movement. You're still moving it a little bit, but he's helping you get, like he's helping me get to that end range. And then I yeah. lower it on my own slowly. And then Dr. Ben, um, he kind of went to a little bit more advanced movements that actually gave us a little bit even more where that person either gives you a little bit of extra resistance. So um, just gives you that little extra, oh, this is really hard. This is really hard. I can't hold, you know, or just hold it and then try yeah. to lift it. So if you get to that point where, oh, it's hard, but stop, hold it, and then maybe even try to go back, try to lift it a little bit again before end ending that um, movement. Love that. Love and that. And that so just really gives you that little no, extra release. No pump, 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 pump stop this is actually go as far as you can and then i guess a few days later see if you can improve and a few days later see if you can improve and you will see the improvement won't you because your muscles oh. will get stronger and, and tougher it's amazing actually now that you mention that so i don't know how long you've been doing it for dan a few weeks <laughs> uh, <laughs> not even a couple of times in the last three weeks so i okay. need to get into it properly so if you I, can I do, do okay 15, week, right? yeah so if you do 15 minutes twice a week so the theory yeah. is 
Um, one of the, obviously there's odd number of days in the week. So one of them is going to be three days apart. One of them is going to be four days apart. Um, you don't necessarily want to do four days, four days, four days, but you can, and that'll just be a different day. It's, yeah, it's yeah. easier to, for us to plan like Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, yeah. so we have the longer weekend for the Tuesday recovery. So you want recovery time. That's when your body is building the muscle. It's recovering and it's building the muscle. Within six weeks, Dan, and everybody who's listening, when I when we first started this, it was probably 2018. We did a little bit before the event. And then Dr. Ben spoke and he speaks at every one of our conferences now because slow maximum resistance training for metabolic health is fascinating. Um, and yeah. it has in combination with the low carb ketogenic diet, if you're going to go very low carb, releasing those fatty acids and helping you reduce inflammation and build muscle. Okay. So, um, 15 minutes twice a week. So let me go back 15 minutes. We do the exercise. You have three or four days recovery. Um, and while you're eating your optimal protein levels and you're building the muscle and it, um, releasing the, the hormones that, we're talking about, so we're increasing our insulin sensitivity. So we're doing the opposite of insulin resistance yeah. where um, our muscles are getting depleted of glycogen and we're um, building insulin sensitivity. So our muscles are going to need and can use and are able to absorb gl glucose and use it. Um, and then some of the presentations are some on our site. Um, I believe there are some free ones on our site or the, the membership at low carb USA that you can watch any of the presentations on in our back office from any of the 15 conferences that we've done. And Ben's got about five or six. And then there's the free videos that you're talking about. Just talks about the mechanism of what's being released and how you're building muscle and how you're increasing insulin sensitivity and releasing the, those good hormones, human growth hormone, um, building testosterone for men and women we both need it um yeah and things like that I, I believe you asked me a question and i might not have answered it so remind me again if i didn't because it kind of went down that rabbit hole um, um oh no, for any level that, uh, no you said like how frequently do i do it so um i'm going to get into a two-week timetable and like you said it's so important to have the recovery time um and that's the thing 15 minutes now that seems on paper ridiculously small amount of time yeah it this does is it seems like how can that be possible very intense workout isn't it yes because you just, okay so i said the first one we do is um hamstrings and then we yeah. do quadricep flexion quadriceps um so he wants you to do your big muscle groups first those are going to tire you out and then you're going to um so with the bands um you can't do flexion and extension like you can on a seated um seat or lying down hamstrings. So yeah. you're doing uh, squats and um, you know, like for Doug, his legs got, have gotten so strong and he's runner. He's got very muscly legs for a runner. He's got to have some pretty heavy duty bands to use. Well, this um, is the thing about the bands, right? So I've got, the, um, I've got the tubes, which I've got in the handles like you had in your video. Yes. I've now bought the bands as well. And I, I, need, I need to get some gloves or something. Cause I find the bands quite, hard on my hands so i need to hold them with a the glove i think but yeah. i did the uh, the anchor in the door and I was, I was kind of doing the the row and i was terrified of smashing my face in so i could imagine it pinging off and it doesn't because it is you know securely attached but it when is. i did the squat a bit like doug i had you know like a, a few inches of, of cable hardly anything and i took it all the way up to my shoulders and stood up and i thought if this snaps now, it's going to take my leg out. Like, you know, I was terrified <laughs> thinking this is quite scary. Now, I imagine you get used to that because I could feel it pulling under my shoes. There was that much tension in it. I was thinking, I'm going to hurt myself here. So, you know, it that does worry me a little bit. Do, do you get over that fear? Have you had an accident with these things? You is do, it, and we so have not. Um, th but there's been a couple of little things. And so we used to do them in the gym, like I was saying, and we bought the bands yeah. to, for when we were traveling. 
And if um, we had gone to see Doug's families all migrated, immigrated from South Africa to Australia, we went to visit them a couple of times over the last few years um, to see them finally. And we brought our bands with us so we could do them remotely. We even bought a gym membership when we were a little bit more stationary at their house, stayed for a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. We actually bought a few visits to the gym that was nearby. Um, but I don't think we were doing it um, as yeah, we must have been doing it. And then we would go and do cardio on the other days. So we were doing gym base. Okay. And then the gym's closed. So then we got really used to doing our bands at home. And mm -hmm. we did find there were some challenges. Like we were in a condo and only real space that we felt like we had. Because the door should open a certain way. You don't want to feel like you're going to pull that door open. Yes, so you, you don't want to have it closed. Open and like open it with your band. Yeah. The door is closed. So you want to go this way. So it's closing it more, not opening it more. Um, you want to be careful that you know that latch isn't going to come free um again doug was so strong that the bands um he was needing a little bit more resistance with the bands so the arms like for example to do triceps um you would do one of the ones is this way yeah. and um and then um, the chest ones like this but he was having so much resistance that he's almost falling back into the door so i had to be his spot and one of the things I was worried about is we were both going to get hurt because I'm like hanging, literally hanging on him to keep him from boomeranging <laughs> back into the door. And he was just getting stronger and stronger. Oh, that's what I was going to say back into the. So, so everybody be careful with our. So we're going very slowly. We're getting as much resistance as we can safely. You know, you come out a little bit more distance from the door and you can kind of feel it. Like, say I'm doing my tricep ones and I go to do it. I'm like, oh, that's not as hard as it should be. You can increase your distance a little bit away from the door. Yeah, then yeah, those yeah. bands get harder. Now, like you're going to have, have a good stand, like good stable like foot base because you could stable be like bit. you said with Doug, you could be bending backwards. Taking the pressure on your back, which would be really bad for you, wouldn't it? Or yeah, you, know, you got to lean into good, that, so you're going to kind of us falling forwards because I had so much tension. My body was being pulled forwards, even though my arms didn't feel it. I was like, "This is weird." My arms are okay. My whole body wants to fly forward. You know? Yeah, you have to kind of. So you do. You get a little bit of that feeling as you're watching the video and listening to what Dr. Ben's saying, and you're feeling it for yourself, and you're feeling that stability, like where you get that stability where you can move slowly with enough resistance. And, yeah. um, you know, for me, um, I that's what I was going to say. So when I first started this, I hadn't, I had to be, had been really careful with a knee of, on my right knee. I had, when we were doing our martial arts, we had um, doing hit. Uh, we used to do a lot of hit right before we did boxing and kickboxing. We did a, a circuit of, it depended on the day and the coach would put um, whatever he wanted. So it would be um, most people are familiar with the kind of hit. Let's like burpees. Um, yeah. So you're up, down for a push up, jump up, down again for a push up, jump them. up again. I so a burpees. lot of those. Um, and, but it could be anything that was high intensity interval. So you do something for 20, 30 seconds, and then you stop and you move on to the next thing, but not long enough that you can barely even catching your breath. So that's high interval yeah, training. Yeah. That's normal high interval training that people think, um, go and do some jumping decks, jumps, squats, you know, those kind of things. We had done lunges one time and with a younger coach. And I was like getting to be almost, you know, mid forties, upper fifties. And I, should have known not to lunge across the room because my legs don't do lunges very well. So I really injured right, my knee. Right. I hurt my right. knee so much that it was hard to do stairs. It was hard to sit and get back up again. So I actually had a lot of atrophy in my quadricep because right. I wasn't able to use my knee well. So the very first uh, six weeks that we started doing this, we were using equipment. So we were able to use our gym equipment and my knee, my quadricep literally started building within two weeks. I was like, wow, I can feel a quadricep Whoa. muscle here. Within two six weeks. weeks. That's like what? A, what an hour is eight. That's eight. That's eight workouts. That's eight 15 oh, eight minutes. Workouts. Okay. That's, no, one, two, three, four, four. 15 minute workouts. It's one hour. And I was like, whoa, I haven't felt a muscle in my quad in, and probably it was, I think it was probably on two years then. And That's amazing. It was amazing to me. And I kept kept feeling more and more muscle build into that leg that had been injured. 
And um, within six weeks, we saw Dr. Ben again, and he looked at my deltoids and my um, um, I said triceps. And he was like, you did not have that before. Six weeks, people were noticing. So, and so he knew he right. had started you working out. me, Pam. But other people noticed that because we were at our local community, we usually we used to try to do every month. We had a free community meeting where everybody came together. We had uh, someone hosted. It was at his gym. And we'd have some speakers and some time to talk and network and share stories, um, some testimonials, depending. But I wish we could do that more again. Hopefully we'll Amazing. be able to get it soon. Um, but for people to notice that I was changing in lean muscle, building muscle within six weeks was amazing to me. And to know that I was helping an injury within that yeah. short time. So that's I that's what I started to say before when I was like, did I answer your question? So you can notice changes in a very short time. I We used the bands when we had lockdowns and gyms closed. Um, yeah. But we are talking, once you start advancing, you have to just be mindful of, is this optimal? Is this enough weight for me? Is this so much weight that it's making a little bit unstable for me? Right. Um, the learning curve of you're just starting out, does, can you get to it so that you're stable? Um, a, an actual gym equipment, like we actually got something at our house um, where we weren't able to go back to the gym. We took what we would have been paying for our gym membership and got some equipment in our house because um, squats, it was hard for Doug to do the, the amount of thing that he needed for squats. He was using a lot of weights for his arms. Now we've got it all in a built-in thing. I really needed a more stable squat because the bands were a little bit, weren't great for my squats. And Ben helped me adjust it. And you guys can... Um, Contact Ben. He's really good at asking questions. If you're not sure about, it. I know you were going to write to him and ask him some questions. Yeah, you know, sure. I would. I his email. I'm definitely going to contact him and see. I would literally squat a into a sitting on a you, chair. Know, yeah, and right. he's really good at answering questions. Um, he's not cheap to get a personal training session with him, but it's very well worth it. Maybe he just does one consult with you, and that's so worth it because he wow. can help you work around injuries if you need to or stability yeah. or you're not sure. Cause I had to like literally my, my squat didn't go down at a certain point. Like I was able to do it and then I did something to my knee again. So I was like, you know, it had nothing to do with the workout. It was out, but then I had to adjust my workout again. So I was squatting into a chair and then back up again. And we just modified it a little bit for what I needed. And yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Doug as a partner was able to help me that, but now that we we bought the one that we actually have a seated flex, so I can do the seated flexion and the seated ex and extensions for hamstrings, my knee is a million times better again. Um, it has you know a what? bar. I that's... tried running, and uh, last year I did this um, app. I'm sure you got the same thing in the states. It's couch to five k. So I don't want that oh, yeah. miles, but you know it's kind of like trying to encourage non runners to start running. And every time I go for runs, and I've noticed I've known this for years. My, I always have a problem in my right knee, and my sister's got the same thing. I don't know if it's the technique, the way we're running, or whatever, but actually, I noticed that when I went to um, sessions at the gym this summer, I went to the boot camp, and because there's a lot of running around all the time when you're doing the exercises, my right knee was hurting again, and then that meant I could I missed some lessons and some classes because I was damaging myself and I couldn't go back. And so, I think this is a great thing about Dr. Ben. It seems like from what you're saying you work around your injury so that you don't keep making it worse, but you can hopefully strengthen the muscles so that you don't get injured so much. Um, yes. I think a lot point. of, a lot of injuries that we occur that we um, have, I was going to say a different word, but it's not coming off my tongue um, is because there are certain parts of our, like, for example, our leg, our, um, I learned this when I worked in the orthopedic department, uh, the orthopedic office, um, so your knee has to steer a certain way and there are different muscle groups and some of them yeah. aren't as strong as they should be. And some are strong because we use them so it pulls more often. You one direction, right? I suppose. Yeah. The so strong you've got one a weak pulls and the weak one gives. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got a strong one and a weak one. And it's not, it's not steering the way it should. Your kneecap's supposed to go a certain way. And, you know, women yeah. often that are mid um, quadriceps aren't as strong or our mid and our inner legs aren't as strong as they should be. So, you know, um, 
that that strength building as and steering my knee has really gotten better. And like I was saying, he did um some like post op uh, spinal surgery place. So working the strengthening your back and your quadriceps and your glutes really help and your core really help um, um, stabilize our backs. You know, most yeah. of us are will suffer from back pain at some time in our life because of all of our yeah. sitting and the way we're moving or not strong. So this is actually really strengthening. I've had a lot of back problems. So this is really strengthening a lot um, of um, my core and my spine. So I was saying with the bands, you do squats and then you do, it's kind of like a, a deadlift, right? You're, you're strengthening yep. that back, back, yep. um, your back, your glutes and your hamstrings, which is thing, which are things that we don't use enough, especially when we're sitting at our computers. So definitely um, that's great. Thanks, Pat. I'll tell you what, I'm going to, I'm going to update you in a few weeks time when I'm ripped and then I can say, you know, you started me on my on my journey. Just um, do it really, consistently. Do, do it consistently. 15 minutes. You can, you know, it's, when people think, oh, I don't have time to work out. 15 minutes twice a week is a, a short enough amount of, way, of time. Bands to make are it. really easy to move around. So, you know, you're not going to take dumbbells with you, are you, to work or whatever. But you could have, last, you could have these elastic bands. You have these bands in your bag easily. Just one of them is all you need or you know, one of the, the one cores, sets. The, the, the one, yeah. And you just basically put it in your bag, leave it at work or whatever, put it on the door, boom, you do your workout, you're done. So mm. I'll definitely do that. Now I'm just a bit aware of the time we have been talking for a while and it's been a wonderful podcast, but there's a key question I've got for you now. Um, and I was going to ask you so much about the conferences and I think we should at least touch on them at the end here. Um, can you tell me one thing you've learned from one of the conferences that just blew your mind and you just remember that moment and you thought, wow that was incredible gosh there's been so many and i think about um i think i mentioned it and so i should think of a different one because when georgia Ede was talking about you know nutrients for our brain health and how much alzheimer's is becoming such a big big risk um in our yeah, i was there um, at the talk you did in 2017 about um type 3 diabetes that was type three diabetes is well. Alzheimer's equals Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's of the brain. Now, do, where have we heard that insulin resistance of the brain, having too many carbohydrates in our system, that our body isn't res able to respond to them anymore, that we have in, too much of an insulin response every time we have carbohydrates, so that the insulin isn't able to do the things it's supposed to do that our body is almost like that when the child says mom 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 is you know mom stops listening to mom after the 50th time well our body stopped listening yep. to insulin after the thousandth time that day and we're not able to use it so though that is what had been one of the biggest aha moments so when georgia talked about it for the brain but for our whole body like start thinking about the processes of our bodies and what's making them dysfunctional and what can make them more functional. So we're talking yeah. about Dr. Ben's exercise program, increasing our insulin sensitivity and reducing our insulin resistance. Our dietary choices can do the same thing. It's going to start making it functional and not dysfunctional. So somebody said that in a presentation that's like, oh, so we're, you know, some things going out right now, um, Ken Barry saying is disease is diabetes a disease or is it dysfunction from mm. what we've been doing to it all these years? Yeah. Is yeah. it, you know, so if we can start thinking, that's one of the biggest things that I've learned in our conferences. Um, and it's been mentioned a different way, a few different ways from a few different people to start thinking about what makes our bodies function better and not be dysfunctional. So if you, you know what, when I, when I went to a conference in uh, 2017, that was fairly early in my journey. And uh, in all honesty, I was kind of thinking, I knew about insulin. I knew about sugar. I, my wife had gestational diabetes. So I knew that, you know, um, what happens with regards to type two diabetes one day and how sugar levels affect the baby's development, how they affect the, you know, the, the mother, how they can affect somebody with type 2 diabetes in the future. So I kind of was aware of all that, but I was blown away when Georgia Ede and other people were talking about all these other factors in the body and how they're all related to metabolic syndrome. And I didn't quite appreciate until that moment 
just like you said there, how everything is affected. This dysfunction affects different parts of your body, uh, different parts of your health in different ways. But it all comes down to the very same problem of nutrition. Or Imagine that. Imagine that. I mean, people, women who are struggling with fertility, could it just be a dysfunctional aspect of hyperinsulinemia and a carbohydrate intolerance? Our body's not able to process uh, carbohydrates and insulin is not doing its job. Could um, migraine, people who suffer with recurrent debilitating migraine. Which I do, but I don't now so much. But you don't know. I've noticed a difference. And I think I know why now. Because actually it's linked to the other things that happen with, with insulin resistance. My sleep is better now. And the sleep being better, like bad sleep was the cause of the migraines. And so curing, getting on top of my sleep, and a big part of that is going low carb, to sleep better, deeper, longer, means that I don't have the migraines. So there's all these triggers that link to other things as well. Yeah, so many. I mean, I don't know how many people. Um, so, um, you know, one of the big things we thought we'd put this conference on for everybody, but then it really actually came, came to us through the first conference that more healthcare professionals need to have this information because it's not something they're, it's not what they're learning in medical school right now. They're still yeah. teaching old old teachings they're they're still teaching what they learned you know 20 30 years ago new med students are still learning what 20 30 40 50 years ago low fat yeah high carbs so the health medical professional needs to hear this because we've had some come and say i didn't realize all these things could yeah, yeah, yeah be yeah. influenced by it um that um uh they'll have a patient who wanted to lose weight their migraines went away after they started a low carb diet. Their hypertension, their high blood pressure lowered. So they even if they're especially if they're taking blood pressure medication, they need to come off it pretty quickly. Otherwise yeah. they'll have low blood pressure because blood pressure is stabilizing. But oftentimes somebody will be need thinking they need a knee replacement because we're talking about knee pain in an older population where their joints are told that their joints are wearing out, their meniscus is nothing, and they're going to need a joint replacement. Oftentimes, people don't need that joint replacement anymore because the inflammation in their knees gone down, their pain yeah. subsided, they're able to move more, they're able to walk more comfortably, they're able to do stairs more comfortably. Um, so the reduction in inflammation that comes from cutting out um, carbohydrates and reducing insulin and changing the kind of oils like we were talking about, how is that infl- that reduction in inflammation reducing a, a many of the ailments that we kind of have to deal with as well? Because yeah, you're treating the causes. That's what I love about that. You're treating the cause of the problem, not just trying to patch up the problem. You know, Not just problem. put a Band-Aid on it. We're looking at root yeah, cause. Yeah. We're looking at why let's is it this problem way? to abate because it's not being caused anymore rather than let's just suppress the symptoms of the problem. And that's the difference, isn't it? I think yeah. the doctors I know who are the medics who are coming through, who are making the groundbreaking work and now saying, hang on a minute, why is this being caused in the first place? Like Carrie Brown with her bipolar 2 or mm. you know, people with uh, different chronic diseases. And you're like, What's causing the problem? Maybe you could deal with that and then you won't have the problem. And that's inspiring. So, okay, just tell us then quickly now at the end, when's your next conference? And uh, how can people, if they're like, for instance, over on this side of the pond, how can they get involved with your conferences if they can't be there in person? Okay, so January, we're already planning next year. So uh, we just got done with the August 2021 conference here in San Diego locally. A lot of you pe- uh, people joined us online. And Dan, thank you so much for spreading the word to the Low Carb UK about the summer conference. It is still available if anybody wants to go back and watch. All the recordings and replays are there from the last conference. Um, and the registration is on lowcarbusa.org. But January in Florida, in our southeast, it'll be our northern hemisphere winter conference. If anybody's listening to this down under in Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, um, and want to listen to, you can buy a virtual ticket now. Um, uh, when does this going to air, Dan? Uh, this will be like late October. Late October, we'll just be at 25% off code here, you know, and um, uh, 25% off. So it's it's less than $100. 
for the entire weekend to watch virtually and uh, already. And then with that special uh, code um, that we'll have published at that time, I'll give low carb UK. We'll have a special code for you guys oh, at a later time. That respect. will be, you know, just that. Yeah. Low carb. What would you do? Low carb UK was the code. UK low carb. UK low carb code yeah. um, to say. And um, so I think travel from the UK to the U S is okay right now. Um, uh, but if well, anybody who wants, by, who knows by know. January. So what we have is if you buy a virtual ticket now and by January, if it still travels okay from the UK to the US, um, you can upgrade to an in-person ticket. Um, oh, great. Okay. That's available. So there's an upgrade option to anybody who wants to come to Florida. Um, it's a, often a warmer time of year in January in Florida, although it can have a little bit of dips in temperature if the wind comes up and but people who come from a very cold um, area, it's it's not that much of a dip except for us San Diego people and Florida people. Um, yeah, you Californians are all spoiled, <laughs> believe me. You don't know what winters are like. It gets into fifties <laughs> and sixties and we're like, it's cold. It's not, you know, it's not oh. cool weather. I'm but, not tanning. Uh, I'm not tanning. <laughs> I know, I'm not tanning. But um, there's um, not quite three whole days of lectures. Um, fantastic topics going to be covered. Um, wonderful speakers. We've got a few new ones. Um, Philip Ovedia is from Florida. He's been attending our conferences. He's going to speak for the first time on cardiovascular health. We didn't talk a lot about that, but with um, the Ben's exercise program and going low carb, we're reducing inflammation. Let's talk about heart disease. When people talk about any more fat, let's make sure that we cover that co conversation. There's a few, a couple of people talking about um, things that aren't always talked about. There's a lipedema group of people growing in the world that have, Wow. Um, it's going to be talked about um, how can the low carb diet um, make that better um, what are some of the things she's studying and finding Siobhan Huggins? Um, we've got some, Dr. Ben will be there again. We've got some of our regulars speaking. Um, uh, Dr. Ken Berry is going to be with us again. He hasn't been with us since Seattle, 2019. And um, let's see if I can remember anybody else quickly. I'll pull it up. Um, but it does include a dinner with the registration, which is a beautiful time for people to connect. If you come in person, um, we work with the by chef. The way, that is one of the most special things about the conference, which is very hard to promote that, I guess. The big name, bring the people in, the talks, the topics. But actually to have a meal with these people who are like well-known, but also with other people to have the fellowship with yeah. people like you and me, Pam, who are there yeah. to learn and to to share their stories. That and we just really talk like special. this. We say, you know, and tell, and I often uh, we really enjoy hearing other people's journeys. Like, how did you start? Yeah. How did you first hear about this? How, what were you addressing when you started this? Why did you start? Or what, what changed for you once you did start? Yeah. And it's, I can't even, uh, the amount of stories of people that have changed their lives and changing their lifestyle is just, it gives me goosebumps. Yeah. I mean, I've, we've yeah, had yeah. people who have rare diseases completely changed that never heard this from their medical professional completely changed their lives. Um, then they'll meet someone who will do a case study. Um, Eric Westman will do a case series. They'll put together something that they can publish in one of the medical journals that will help more people. Um, it's just that's incredible. It, that's it's so actually impressive. pretty. Thank you for doing that. You're bringing <laughs> people together. And that's. That's you know I'm trying to do it at the moment virtually really through a podcast and my Such Facebook great work. group etc. But actually you're doing it physically and that's you can't you can never replace that. I think that's so special. We all have to really work together because there is so much work to be done in the nutrition yeah. education and awareness space. If if we can just bring more people to be aware of this possibility, we're not saying I would love to say everybody should do this, but we know we've got to get people where they are. But we've got to make sure that. The medical professional knows that this is a valid, effective option for their patients and then present it to, you know, as an option for a multitude of health reasons that, okay, yeah, we have to know that you're talking or we were talking earlier, I think, offline, or maybe you mentioned wheat um, on, when we were recording. We're going to have to meet people talk about food addiction. So Joan Ifland is, and Rob Sivas are often talking about that in our all of our conferences and our previous conferences. We've got to talk about how addictive is sugar-loaded food 
how yep. processed food is compiled to make it more addictive. The stuff in the crunchy bags, and the, yep. Chris, the, the opening the bag, opening the bottle. That's just a thing that like activates our brain cells. It says, oh, I'm going to get something that's going to activate more of my brain cells. How yeah, does yeah. that affect our hunger later? How does that affect what we eat the next time? How does that affect where we spend our money? And how can we change that cycle? So, yeah, Dr. Yeah. you know, we talk about that at every conference now. We've brought that in. The mental, the addiction and the mental component of making a change and also the mental component of how can we improve our mental health by eating well. Um, there's a few other um, speakers that are going to be on this. I don't want to take too much time, but... If you want to go to lowcarbusa.org, look for the Florida Boca Conference. You can look at all of the speakers who are going to be presenting. Their bios are all there to look at. We don't often have the topic of events ready to be up until probably December, January. It's not there yet, but you can look at some of the um, previous one, like for San Diego, and see kind of the topics that are covered. I've mentioned many of them here. It's so important to our health and to the health of others inspirational thank you pam for everything you're doing i mean i didn't know how this conversation was gonna go and i was i had so much to ask about the conferences and the way you do them and why you do them although i think i know that and you know and, and that you put into this but i just want to say this for anyone listening you know you and doug don't make money out of the conferences you know it'd be great if you did i think you should but you you are basically doing this as a service for us as a community and i just want to say a massive thank you on behalf of anyone listening but also mainly myself because you're giving so much to us all. And I, I really think, you know, you're a key part of the building that is the local community. So thank you so, so much. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Dan. And anybody, we're ever so grateful to anybody who supports our mission by buying a ticket to watch from home because it is also every single person who learns a little bit more, who has a takeaway that shares it with one more person that helps us to be able to do the next podcast or the next conference or the next blog or continue to do this work and inspire people like Dan to go on and do the low carb UK podcast. I mean, every single person we have met so many people at so many of our conferences now that go on that can't help themselves, but to share this with others. And that means yeah. the most to us because That's you're true, reaching it? people on your level and you're sharing things that are important to you that are going to change. Well, can I tell you life. some, can I tell you a story, Pam, but this has <laughs> yeah. to be after the recording because it's time sensitive. So I've got a story to tell you, which is top secret, but, um, but you're a part of it and you don't know this yet. So I'll tell you in a minute. But everyone who's listening now, I want to say a massive thank you um, and to you, Pam. Um, and we're going to wrap up there. Have a lovely week, whatever you're doing, guys. And Pam, take care, okay? Thank you so much for your time, everybody, for joining us. Appreciate All it. Right. Bye, Pam. Bye.